think God uses our failures for his glory? How about our weaknesses? Well, these are really great questions. And in case you ever doubt if God can redeem even your worst mistake, well, you're in the right place at the right time. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Today, the Bible bus is traveling through the book of Judges. Not exactly the brightest spot in the Bible, is it? And we'll begin our study in chapter 12. We're looking at the last four judges, actually, of 13 in all. Samson had one of the most amazing opportunities to accomplish something for God and for Israel, yet he was almost a total failure. And the good news? Yep, God used him anyway. We got just a couple of minutes, though, before our study begins. So Greg and I have got a quick update on some stuff that's happening here through the Bible. Yeah, Steve, one of the questions that we hear a lot from our listening family is, how in the world can you guys run this gigantic global ministry, you know, now 130 major languages, 200 total languages, home groups, television, satellite, of course, tons of radio, uh, uh, one of the largest domestic broadcasters, and you have a handful of staff, about a dozen or so staff. And the the answer is... We work in partnership. That's right. Uh, We have very high trust partnerships. In fact, one of my number one tasks is to maintain and develop the high trust partnerships because they are so effective. And so today we want to, we want to tell a story and this is, this is a God story that we are just privileged to, to enter into. And I'm going to go back almost 70 years, 65, 70 years ago, I believe 1956. Most of us uh, evangelical Christians have heard of Jim Elliott. He was one of the five missionaries that went down to Ecuador to minister to the a very uh, very well known dangerous tribe, and they tried to make contact with them. And five of them were murdered. They were martyred for their mm-hmm. faith. So this happened, and and it, it shook the world in many ways. But when you go back to that time zone, what was happening at the same time I never knew was a worker, a construction worker named Ivan Schoen, was working in New York City, was on his lunch break, read this story in the New York Times, closed the paper, went to his boss, said, I'm quitting. I'm going to go be a missionary in Latin America. Wow. And this man then went to a different part of Latin America, to the country of Suriname, to the Wayana tribe okay and then there's this wonderful story and we're going to do our very best to to post a video about this on our website so you can learn the whole story but the story is he learns the language they witness to the different tribes people they start coming to christ they develop a bible and then just during covid they finally got the full bible through our partnership with transworld radio they connected with this missionary family, the son of Ivan Schoen. He's a guy named Tom Schoen. He is now a TWR missionary. They want to take through the Bible into the Wayana language and do home groups. Wow. That is so exciting. <laughs> that is incredible. I mean, I mean, only God could orchestrate something like this. Yeah. Because I, ne- I never cooked this up. You couldn't cook yeah. this up. Yeah, and it comes back to what, what we kicked this uh, discussion off with and that it's about partnerships. This yeah. never would have happened Absolutely. because none of these folks are through the Bible employees. Absolutely. But you know what? We can come together as believers in Christ and share, much like Paul talks about with the different churches having distributed ministries in different parts of the world yes. at the time when the epistles went out. That's really uh, not quite an, an exact match, but that's an overlay of what we're doing with the ministry of Through the Bible. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but this also wouldn't have happened if George Philip in India hadn't invented the home group yeah. concept. And then TWR heard about it in Latin America and said, let's try that. Yeah, it is just incredibly exciting. Let me pray for us, Greg, as we begin our study. Lord, thank you so much for the way you've moved providentially in the past and orchestrated events that we can now look back and see how you have made it possible for your word to go out in ways that we never imagined. Lord, may we continue to see that in our lives every day, and may you bless the word as it goes out now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now when we come to chapter 12, friends, we come to a very important section here. We read the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together. And they went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We'll burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. When I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. 
And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? Now this was a jealousy of Ephraim. And you're going to find out, Ephraim, it'll be in that tribe that you have an infection. You have a real infection that led to a defection. Later on, when the kingdom is divided in the north and south, the kingdom of Israel, you'll find out Ephraim is the very center of all of the rebellion. It goes back to their jealousy. Jealousy today, I would say, in the church is back of a great deal of our problems. I think what Paul said to the Philippians, he said, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That is, strife and vainglory, which is actually vanity or envy. Those are the two things that cause problems in churches today. And when I hear some person in the church complaining about the fact that they're not running it their way, it's an evidence of the fact that somebody there is very jealous. When I find someone who is opposing the preacher all the time, I know that back of it is jealousy. And that was the problem here. And this man, Jephthah, had to protect himself. They're going to burn his house down right over his head. Verse 4, Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim. Because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of the Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto them, Art thou an Ephraimite? And he said, No. Then they said unto him, Say now Shibboleth. And he said Shibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. Friends, that was a time when your accent better be the right accent. But you see that certain of us in the English language find it difficult to pronounce Spanish words or French words. I remember I studied French in school, but the first time I heard a Frenchman talk, I thought he was putting on. I thought, well, that's not the way I learned French, but that's the way it is. It's difficult for us to frame that. So shibboleth was a pretty good word, and what they said was sibboleth. They couldn't put the H in it, and believe me, that was bad. And we find in verse 7, Jephthah judged Israel six years then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Now, Gilead is on the east bank of the Jordan. Now we have three judges that are mentioned, and they are practically zero. They are three vegetables, by the way. They did nothing. Well, they did something, but they didn't judge Israel. They didn't do what they should have done. Now notice, and after him, I'm reading verse 8 of chapter 12, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had thirty sons and thirty daughters, whom he sent abroad and took in thirty daughters from abroad for his son. He judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem. Now here's a man from Bethlehem. That's way down in the tribe of Judah in the south. And he was the next judge. But he had thirty sons and thirty daughters. And I would have thought he would have worked at getting his daughter's husbands. But instead of that, he's busy getting his son's wives. And I suppose in the seven years he's judge, he didn't have time to get his daughter's husbands. And he didn't have time to judge Israel either. In other words, here's a man that gave all of his time to his family. Now, that's fine, but that wasn't what he was called to do. There's a great deal of nonsense that is abroad today. I heard the story of a preacher that he was on the way to a speaking engagement, and his little son wanted to talk with him. He just sat down and talked to his son and didn't make that engagement. And a great many people think that's wonderful. Well, my friend, that wasn't wonderful. That man was breaking an engagement, and he was spoiling a child. He should have told the little fella, you can show them that you love them and are interested in them without breaking engagements, friend. There is a time when certain things have to be put first. And I think he would better have served the boy to have just sat down for a moment and said to the little fella, your daddy's got a speaking engagement. 
And that's important. And you would want your daddy to make that speaking engagement, wouldn't you? And I think the little fellow would have concurred. And he said, now when daddy gets back, you and I are going to talk these things over. Maybe tomorrow we'll talk them over. I think that would have done more for the boy than what he did. All he did was make a spoiled brat out of the youngster, as I see it. Now, I know I sound like a square, friends, but I don't approve of this judge here. I don't think he did anything. He is mediocrity, you may be sure. Now, the next one, verse 11. And after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. And Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Ijalon in the country of Zebulon. Well, that's all we know about him. He did nothing. He didn't even have 30 sons and 30 daughters. Apparently, all he did was twiddle his thumbs. Then we have the next one, and this is verse 13 now of chapter 12 of Judges. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a pyrethonite, judged Israel, and he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on three score and ten ass colts, and he judged Israel eight years, and Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Parthenai, died, and he was buried in Pyrathon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. He did nothing, but he out Jared, Jared. Talk about keeping up with the Joneses. He really kept up with the Jairs, and he outdid him. He had only 30 sons, and he got them 30 little ass colts, 30 little donkeys. This man had 40 sons, and beside that, 30 nephews. That's 70. And I want to tell you, it must have been quite a sight to see that man drive out of town with his boys and his nephews. That would be 71 of them riding out of town. Why, if you'd have had a parade of Jaguars, Mustangs, Pintos, Cougars, and all the like, you wouldn't have had anything like that. And this man really had a tiger in the tank. And out he goes with this crowd here. And that was all for show. It didn't contribute to the nation Israel. What music? They called the burra, the little donkey. They call him the mockingbird or the lark of the desert. And he can really bray. And that's all that this man contributed. Not much, friends. These are three judges we just pass over. Now we come to a judge that you can't pass over. Actually, he is outstanding. But he had probably the most glorious opportunity that any man ever had. Everything was propitious for a career, and a brilliant future for this man, Samson. And he failed. That is the tragedy of this man's life. He was a sinner. There'll be some questions we'll have about him, but in chapter 13 we read now, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. These were the worst enemies that Israel had with the Philistines. Now God raises up a man by the name of Samson to be the judge. And this is actually the last time we're going to read in the book of Judges that the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. We're going to find out that this small civil war that took place in Jephthah's day becomes a pretty big thing later on. And actually, the book of Judges ends in absolute confusion. And we'll see that later on. But now here is, in one sense, the man who is the last of the judges. It's this man, Samson. And this is the seventh apostasy, and the last that's mentioned they were conquered by the Philistines, but only partially delivered through Samson. Actually, this man was a failure. There are three things about Samson that we want to notice as we move through this section. We have the secret of Samson's success given, and we have the secret of Samson's strength given. And then we have the secret of Samson's failure given also. And again, let me repeat, never was a man born with a more glorious opportunity than this man. Now, let me read verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites. Now, we have been in the southern part, and now we go all the way to the north. You see, the Philistines actually were along the coast, 
mostly in the southern part, in what we call today the Gaza Strip. They were in that area. But you'll find out that this man, Samson, although of the family of Dan, he comes all the way south, and you'll find him moving in that land, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. Now, here is the birth of this boy, Samson. His mother was barren, and actually his birth is as miraculous as Isaac was, just as much so are as Joseph and Benjamin. Now in verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall be on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now you have here the birth of Samson, and it actually was, I think you could say, miraculous, and he was given a glorious opportunity, and everything was propitious for a career, brilliant future, and before he was born, God had marked him out. God raised him up for a gigantic task to deliver Israel, and they were in a bad way here. God had delivered them into the hands of the Philistine because of their sin. Now, the angel of the Lord that appeared to the mother of Samson, said what he was to be, that he was to be a Nazarite. Now, you'll recall back in the sixth chapter of the book of Numbers, we had the vow of the Nazarite, the vow that he took, and it was a threefold vow. He was not to touch strong drink. The fact of the matter is, he wasn't to have anything in the world to do with grapes. Verse 3, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, he shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of drinks, nor eat moist grapes, nor dried. He's not to even eat grapes. The grape was that fruit that spoke of the joy of the Lord. And we're told today, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And what does the Spirit of God do? Why, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit of God. And it meant that Nazarite was to find his joy in the Lord and not find it in anything down here. He was not to touch strong drink. And the second thing, he was not to cut his hair. And what does that mean? Well, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, doth not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. But the Nazarite, you see, would be willing to bear shame. And that's the reason a razor is not to touch his head. Then we're told the third thing, he was not to come near a dead body. In other words, there'd be no natural claim on him. He had put God first, and God would come above his relatives and his loved ones. The Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear that except you deny father and mother, and to deny them means not to ignore them. He didn't say that but he means to put Christ first. And we've lost sight of that today. Now, Samson was a Nazarite. He was God's man. And that was the secret of his success, that he was God's man. And he was raised up for a great purpose. And his success was in God. And only as he performed his God-appointed tasks, but he never succeeded. You notice what it says here in verse 5? He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistine. Now, success knocked at his door. He was a beginner. He only made a beginning of everything. He was a jack of all trades, but he never finished it. He'll begin to deliver Israel. He never finished that task. Now, we got a lot of Christians like that. You remember Paul said to the Galatians, ye did run well. Who did hinder you? Started out well. We have a great many people who began to read the Bible. I'm thrilled today at the number of people over this land that are reading through the Bible with us. But I have news for you. There's some that fall by the wayside. They don't go on with it. They just begin. There are a lot of people that are beginners. 
I know a lot of Christians. I've been a pastor 40 years, friends. I've met Christians. Oh, Dr. McGee, I'm beginning to do this. I'm going to do this. They start something, but they never conclude it. They never finish the task that they're called to do. Now, will you notice that this boy is born into the family? And the woman bore this boy, Samson. And you have the interview, and I'll not go into the details here, but I'll come down to the birth of Samson in verse 24. And the woman bare a son, called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Now, that's way up in the north. God began to move him there up in that particular place. Now, this is the secret of Samson's strength. I want you to notice something. This is very important to see that we'll come to next time. Samson's strength was not in his arms, although he killed a thousand Philistines with those arms. And Samson's strength was not in his back, although he carried the gates of Gaza on his back. And that was a pretty good undertaking. And Samson's strength was not in his hair, although he was weak when that was gone. Samson, you know, has been depicted as a big bruiser with muscles. I want to say something about it, but the thing to note, friends, is something that I think is very important here, and it's this statement concerning him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. He was only strong when the Spirit of God was moving him and just cutting off his hair is actually not what weakened him. That hair was the badge. He was a Nazarite. And the Spirit of God was not on him when he had his hair cut. Why? Because he had failed in his Nazarite vow. He had not made good. Now, he's always depicted, as we said, as in these advertisements of certain tonics. You have before taken and after taken. Before taken, it's a little dried up weasel. After you take, he's a great big muscled bruiser. Samson, actually, friends, is the biggest sissy in the Bible or out of the Bible, and he was a little dried up milk toast man. He was not the strong man in the circus. He was the midget in the circus. Actually, his name means little son, S-U-N, little son. Have you ever noticed? He asked, for instance, his parents to get a wife for him. He didn't have nerve enough to go out and ask the girl to marry him. And he had long hair. (laughs) He was a sissy. And he was a riddle maker. We'll see that as we go along. And he played pranks like a schoolboy. He took off the gates of Gaza, walked off with him. And then he allowed every woman to make a fool of him. He's not a he-man. He's not the strongest man in the Bible. He's the weakest. And he's the picture on the bottle of vitamins or tonic before taken, not after taken. And this fellow was tied to his mama's apron string like a little sissy, for that's what he was. And we are told that the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. And when the Spirit of God began to move him, he was strong. But when the Spirit of God wasn't upon him, he was as weak as water. It's very interesting. You know, the world today is looking for strong things They wanted to know his strength, and they didn't realize God chooses the weak things. And that's the reason they marveled in that day. They said, how can this little midget, this little scrawny, milquetoast fellow, how can he perform those feats? There was only one explanation. God did it. You know, the world makes a noise. God says, be still and know that I'm God. Man made the horn. God made the silent depths of the forest. But Samson was the hero of his day. Why? He looked like he was strong, but he was not. Well, we're going to follow the story of Samson next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
Well, we still have a lot to learn from the life of Samson. So join us next time at this same time as the Bible Bus continues its five-year journey through the Bible. Until then, if you want to get in touch with us, you can always visit ttb.org. You can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And you can always send your email to biblebus at ttb.org. And if you still like to write a letter, we love getting those. Just write that to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. Remember, we love to hear from you. Jesus made it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Our journey on the Bible bus today is supported by the prayers and gifts of fellow passengers as we travel through the Bible.